Good evening. I would like to welcome you to this Monday, October 10th, 2022 workshop session of the Carmel Clay School Board. Um, roll call, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Everyone who is present today, let us now make roll. Thank you. Please join me in rising for the Pledge of Allegiance. We have some exciting um, district updates and spotlights on excellence tonight, but before we get started, I just want to recognize that today is World Mental Health Day. Um, I'm so thankful, Emily, for spotlighting that on our social media. Um, World Mental Health Day was started in 1992 and intended to fight the stigmas and promote mental health education, and Carmel Clay Schools is really proud to not only partner with St. Vincent's, um, but to really provide support needed for all students um, so that they can feel physically and psychologically safe appropriately in the classroom. Um, part of that safety, I'm really excited to announce, um, in addition to that safety, there's some other wonderful things that have been going on in our district, and I'm very excited to talk about those first. Um, first, of a medical emergency at Cherry Tree Elementary. Fire Chief David Hasbro. Good evening. Oop. Good evening, uh, members of the Carmel Clay School Board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, come here this evening. My name is David Hobbush. I am the fire chief of the Carmel Fire Department. And uh, tonight, uh, I am uh, proud to share a, uh, a save uh, that took place at one of your buildings. And um, is Peter English here by chance? Well, there you are. Uh, I have not had the chance to meet Mr. Principal English. And so um, I'm just going to say hello here. Come on up here. Um, Mr. English and his friends at Carmel Clay Schools, uh, I'd like to congratulate them and uh, this school system on participating uh, in um, a bleeding control program uh, that we partnered with. And for those in the audience that don't know what I'm talking about, uh, this is our EMS chief, Andrew Young. Uh, and he's holding up um, a bleeding control kit. Uh, this is something that uh, we had reached out to Carmel Clay Schools to partner with. We were able to contact our vendor and actually produce this specific kit for our community. We were able to do this. Uh, if you see most programs, it's called bleeding control. Uh, ours is called bleeding control. The other national uh, brand is uh, Stop the Bleed. And so we were able to produce this kit for approximately half the cost of what the national brands are. And so this kit is approximately $25. And so I'm proud to tell everybody in the audience and anybody who might be watching this program uh, that this uh, program, uh, I believe, is, is not duplicated anywhere in the United States of America. Um, I'm proud to say that in our community, every single classroom uh, throughout our community, every single bus, every public building has one of these kits inside of it. And so this kit was actually used and deployed by Principal English uh, at his school this summer. There was a construction worker uh, that uh, had a uh, severe cut and was bleeding and came to the front door and rang the doorbell and then collapsed. And so uh, Principal English acted quickly and took out the life-saving um, tourniquet that is included in this kit. And uh, I, I, we've exchanged emails, but we have never met or, or talked. And so it's my understanding that he deployed the tourniquet. And um, although it hurt, I'm certain that his patient did not care. And so his patient had passed out. And um, uh, early on when we were talking about deploying this program, we talked about being a force multiplier. And I will simply say that Principal English, you were a force multiplier. Uh, on that day, you actually saved a life. And so... We're here tonight to thank you and to recognize you and um, 
and uh, thank this board and thank the Carmel Clay School System. Uh, we're proud of the partnership that we have um, in our community. This is a very unique relationship, um, and I, I'm also, um, um, I know that there's a great relationship with our uh, police and uh, the Carmel Clay School System, and so um, we're just very happy to celebrate um, this difference in our community and uh, what took place at uh, the elementary school with Principal English, and so uh, we have a very small token of our appreciation, uh, Principal English. It is our challenge coin. And so I'm going to present this to you tonight. Uh, on the back, it talks about our core values for our organization, honor, service, integrity, tradition, and excellence. And so um, I hope that you put this in a special place. And so thank you very much. Please join me in congratulating Principal English. Has the board had, a, you guys have had a chance to see these kits, have you not? Yep, we've been trained too. Okay, perfect. If anybody in the, in the audience would like to see them, uh, we're happy to pass them around. Uh, there is a little QR code there, so if you don't know what you're doing, you can take out your phone and it'll uh, give you about a 30-second version of how to actually apply this. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. On behalf of the school board, our eternal thank you to the Carmel Fire Department. Um, we had the privilege of being trained for these kits. We are so thankful that they're in our schools, although we hope we never have to use them. Um, we are so thankful, as we can see here, that there may be times when we do. So thank you so much for your continued support of our students and um, for our staff and teachers as well. Thank you. I'd now like to turn it over for, to Mrs. Deanna Pittman for another medical emergency. Hopefully this is the last one. We do not want any more. No. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Ms. Pittman. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Deanna Pittman, principal of Carmel Middle School. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight to recognize some amazing people. On Wednesday, August 17th, at the Carmel Middle School eighth grade football game, Max Hoppel, a fan and grandparent of a student from the opposing team, had a medical emergency while sitting in the stands next to his wife and daughter, Carrie. Mr. Hoppel was unresponsive, and fans quickly went into action to assess the situation. Deanna Reed, Heather Dean Falk, and Tina Harrison worked together and began administering CPR. Carmel Middle School eighth grade football coach, Kevin Vogt, witnessed what was taking place and jumped the fence to assist with chest compressions. During this time, 911 was called and Carmel Middle School Athletic Director Darren Monk ran to retrieve our automated external defibrillator located within the area. The AED was able to be used to resuscitate Mr. Hopple. First responders arrived quickly, took over CPR, and transported Mr. Hopple to the hospital. On behalf of Carmel Middle School, we would like to thank the fans, the staff, and the first responders who, because of your quick, heroic actions, saved a man's life. 
We would also like to thank the Carmel Clay School Administration for their support in having AEDs available to us on campus. Because of you all, Mr. Hopple is literally here with us today. At this time, we would like to recognize um, our fans and staff and first responders. So if you could come on up, and um, Dr. Dudley will give you a certificate and then head on up to the, to the board. Uh, Deanna Reed. <laughs> Heather Dean Falk. Uh, Tina Harrison, she was not able to be here this evening. <laughs> Coach Kevin Vogt. <laughs> Athletic Director Darren Monk. <laughs> we also have our first responders here this evening, Corey Richards. Lieutenant Brad Allen, Engineer Dustin Schooler, and Firefighters Jacob Johnson, Jordan Cox, and Scott Woodburn. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Hobbush, who would also like to say a few words. Thank you. Wow. Uh, sir, I, I got to tell you, it's, it's, it's rare when we get to meet some of our patients and uh, to have them walking and talking and here celebrating this with us tonight just makes tonight so much more special. Quite frankly, we didn't know that you were going to be here, so thank you for sharing your time and coming to celebrate this big event with us. And we're just so happy to see you up and walking. And uh, for, for all the, the bystanders, I talked about being a force multiplier. And, uh, you know, first responders, uh, we, th th there's a reason that, that we say that we're first responders. But quite frankly, you truly, in this instance, you were the first responder. And I, I can tell you that uh, AEDs uh, and uh, good quality CPR save lives. And tonight is a perfect example of all of that. And so on behalf of this community, on behalf of this gentleman's family, I say thank you uh, to the first responders. Thank you for uh, making us proud, making this community proud, and uh, doing your job uh, as trained professionals, uh, putting forth the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that uh, you have. And so uh, this is a great, great, great celebration. And uh, to the school board members, thank you for the opportunity to come here and celebrate uh, our friends. And uh, to our new friend, thank you and your family for celebrating with us tonight and sharing in this special event. So um, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all. One last thing. Sorry, guys. Um, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Carrie Butcher. She is the daughter of Max Hoppel, and she would like to thank you all as well. Thank you. Um, my name is Carrie Butcher, and my event was a lot harder than I thought it would be. My son, Clark, is a member of the HIJH football team, and that's my dad, Max Hoppel, who suffered the heart attack at the Carmel Middle School game on August 17th. While this is really difficult, I am thrilled to be here tonight to honor all of these selfless heroes. But as I've said before, I know a lot of you got an email from me. There really are no adequate words to say thank you for saving my dad's life. August 17th started like any other day. The week before, we dropped our oldest son off at college for the first time, and our daughter was heading back to IU the next day, and so we were excited for the distraction of a junior high football game. 
I don't think this is spilling any family secrets, but my parents are not tech gurus. So they have difficulty putting an address on their phone and finding their way to a game. So they instead drove to our house in Fishers and rode to the game with us. Thank goodness, because that was the first miracle, first in a series of miracles that happened that day. Had my dad been driving, or been at home, or been anywhere else, his outcome would not have been the same. Right after entering the gates of the game, we stopped to chat with some of our HSB friends, including the Reeds, um, including Deanna, who um, miraculously is, is a nurse practitioner in the cardiac area. Um, after speaking with the Reeds, we entered the stands to find our seats with me at the front of the line and my dad at the back. And my dad, or my husband Jason and I heard a really loud noise and it sounded like a child falling off the bleachers. And we turned around and we realized an older gentleman had fallen. And I think it took us a few minutes to realize, oh my gosh, that's my dad. Um, so I'm a CPA by trade, so any emergency that I am trained for is, is, is not one of this caliber. Um, Jason went over and started to pull my dad out from under the bleachers. I had no idea what to do, and all I could think of was, uh, run for Deanna. So I ran over to Deanna, and I'm not even sure what I said other than, I think my dad collapsed, can you help me? Um, it was summer, she had on flip-flops, she kicked off her shoes, and without hesitation, came running. She immediately took control of the situation while I alternated between wandering in the bleachers and the haze and sitting because I could no longer stand. Within seconds of Deanna taking control, so many strangers, heroes, jumped in without hesitation. Complete strangers offered their expertise, trading off chest compressions, mouth to mouth, running for the AED, including even the football coach of the team we were about to play, which blows my mind. Strangers offered us rides to the hospital, kind words, hugs, compassion for my college-aged daughter who stayed at the game with my son, who unfortunately witnessed much of the chaos from the field. I'm thankful that there are some nights of that evening that my brain won't allow me to remember. I'm haunted by some things I can't forget, but I am thankful that in my haze, I will never forget looking up and seeing so much goodness around me, so much kindness from so many people who rushed to save a stranger without a second thought. We've been told my dad flatlined at least three times that day, and his body began to expire again on the OR table as he was prepped for his cath later that night. His left major artery was completely blocked. He takes good care of himself. He goes to the doctor when he should. He had recently been to the family physician for some warning signs that I think his doctor just didn't recognize. So many miracles lined up to save him. My parents riding to the game with us. Deanna was at the game and she was supposed to be working late. The school having an AED, which per the surgeon he would not have survived without. And all of you. Both of my parents were longtime teachers, and my dad was also a coach of many sports. And when he woke up in the Carmel ER, one of his former tennis players was there. She was his nurse in the ER, which helped to comfort him. We were eventually transferred to the heart hospital where we, he received a stent just in time. It's been a long, slow, and anxiety-filled recovery process the past 54 days, but who's counting? Um, we started with home nursing care and PT, and my dad is now attending cardiac rehab three days a week to continue recovery. And he's supposed to move up to the maximum amount, amount of time on each of the three pieces of rehab equipment this week. So he's doing well. But none of this will be possible without your selfless actions. In addition to saving my dad's life, you also saved my mom's. In January, my parents will celebrate 55 years of marriage. Because of a, one of her diagnoses, my dad is my mom's primary caregiver, and she depends on him. So thank you, though that feels inadequate, for also saving my mom. Clark is the youngest of our three kids, and our two oldest have already graduated from HSC and have played numerous sports over the years. And no matter the sport, no matter the level, um, 
in our house, whenever we play caramel, the last thing we say to, our, to each other before leaving the house is, it's always a good day to be caramel. <laughs> but now you all went and saved my dad's life. <laughs> so I don't feel very good saying that anymore. <laughs> I feel like Dr. Seuss is the Grinch whose heart grew three sizes when he finally realized all the goodness in the world around him. It turns out there's room in my heart for caramel after all. <laughs> Our family will be eternally grateful for all of you and will continue to pray that your lives will be richly blessed. Thank you. Thank you so much to the Carmel Fire Department, first responders, and families um, that attended tonight. Um, I also want to say a thank you on behalf of our, on behalf of our students who were there. Um, goodness gracious, you guys. Um, Mr. Rogers, who's a, a fan favorite of mine, always says when something's scary to look for the helpers. And I'm sure that was very scary for a lot of people there. And so I'm very thankful that you guys st stood up and showed our students there what it really takes to be a true citizen, a true friend, and neighbor. So thank you again for, on behalf of our school district. We are going to continue with our meeting, but you are very welcome <laughs> to go ahead home, be with your family. Again, thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. There's no public comment tonight, so we're going to move on to consent. May I have a motion to approve consent on items? So moved. Thank you, Layla. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving consent, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion carries.
We will now move on to an action item, the preliminary resolution regarding the issuance of general obligation bonds and authorizing a publication of a notice of public hearing regarding the appropriation of the proceeds of the bonds. Mr. Roger McMichael. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this is a, a recommended additional bond issue. <clears throat> it, it's a part of the project that was initially approved in 2020. Uh, we anticipated selling um, three bonds, one of which had a two series, so it um, almost looks like four bonds. But um, So this was the, uh, the final bond that was anticipated. Uh, and as I noted in the, um, um, the background information, that this will primarily support um, various projects at the stadium, um, as well as uh, there'll be some funding here for the uh, completion of the natatorium as well. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve action item 5.1? So moved. Thank you, Layla. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any board discussion? All right, we'll call this to a vote. All those in favor of approving the preliminary resolution regarding the issuance of general obligation bonds and authorizing publication of a notice of public hearing regarding the appropriation of the proceeds of the bonds, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We will now move on to digital safety. Hopefully there are less tears. <laughs> but maybe there will be. I'm all for it. <laughs> all right. Mrs. Christy Cloud. Thank you, members of the board, for having us here tonight to talk about digital safety in Carmel Clay Schools. It seems fitting that we're here during the month of October, as October is Cybersecurity Month, and we've rebranded that in Carmel Clay Schools to really talk about digital safety. Cybersecurity tends to lend you to believe that you are talking about the technology team and how we defend the district, but digital safety really talks about all of, whoops, pardon me, all of us being incorporated together to defend against threats. So recently, you will have noticed that there have been many opportunities appearing in the um, press about different uh, outbreaks that have occurred in school districts across the nation. Back in May of 2022, Chicago Public Schools was attacked. One of the vendors that they used for teacher evaluations faced a, a bad actor who was attempting to gain access to teacher and student evaluation information. And once they did so, they then released that information publicly. And so you might wonder, why are school districts continuing to be targeted? And ultimately, it's because we are a soft target. We tend to have small IT staff we have limited budgets, and we have tons of data. Not only staff data, but we also have student data. And that student data is usually pristine, it hasn't been used in any kind of event, and therefore it's very valuable on the black market. So schools are left to take a very proactive approach in trying to defend against these cyber actors. We have to do a lot of planning and a lot of training, not only for our team, but for the entire community at large. In September of this year, just recently, you may have heard of a messaging app that began sending explicit messages to parents all across the nation. And while we do not currently use this vendor, this event could have happened to any one of our vendors. And it was unique because it was an attack that involved credential surfing. And so what that means is the bad actors scoured the internet and they looked for usernames and passwords that had been used in previous breaches. And then they used those to log into the system. So they actually didn't get to credentials from this vendor. They found them publicly available on the web. And so that really called to attention the fact that any one of our passwords could lead to a cyber breach. This was kind of the first big attack that we have seen using credential surfing in K-12 schools. Later in September, or actually this one may have happened first, it was over Labor Day weekend, the second largest school district in the nation, Los Angeles Public Schools, notated um, nefarious activity on their network over Labor Day weekend. They immediately began shutting down systems, but unfortunately their data became encrypted. 
and the ransomware that was placed on their servers basically put a key, a secure key, on their data, and it was no longer available. And so in order to get it back, they wanted a ransom. In cooperation with the federal government, the Los Angeles School District was instructed not to pay the ransom, and as expected, a couple weeks later, the data then made its way onto the public web. We are still watching this particular outbreak unfold, and just as you've seen our district respond as we see tragic events in physical safety, we're also responding as we watch other school districts suffer these devastating losses in cyber safety and learning from them, finding out what went wrong, what did they do to prevent it, what are they doing next time, what are they doing differently, and we're making those same type of changes in our environment to help protect our students and staff. This event was also interesting because it brought thousands of school districts together to sign petitions to advocate for the federal, with the federal government for additional funding to defend against cyber outbreaks. And that's really the first time that we've seen everybody come together. They're championing the FCC to allow us to use E-rate funding to pay for cybersecurity incidents. That has not been approved yet, but that is something that there is much advocacy happening about right now. In September, later in September of this year, the state of California did something that we're really proud of. They enacted some new legislation to help protect children under the eight, age of 18 from online vendors who market to school districts and to students. And we really believe this type of legislation will have an impact over all of the nation because as the vendors have higher standards to uphold in California, that will then help our students in the state of Indiana because they will then do business here and also have those higher standards. This particular piece of legislation out of California is important to us because the last time we saw federal legis legislation regarding cyber and student data privacy was back in 1998, and that's when COPPA was enacted. Now, to take you back about 25 years, that's when I was a first-year teacher over at Prairie Trace. We were just getting internet, computers to the desktop, email, and to think in those 25 years, the way that technology has changed, the way that you have multiple devices in front of you today, but no federal legislation to keep kids safe has changed in that period of time. When looking at vendors, that is really astonishing to us. So that's why we watch other states and watch the legislation that is happening so that we can continue to look at ways to keep our kids safe. So tonight, <clears throat> pardon me, we come before you with three goals. We want to talk to you about things we're doing with data privacy and security, and we're attempting to earn a national certification, and Kate Masterson, our Assistant Director of Digital Safety and Privacy, will be talking with you about that. We're also going to talk to you about how we keep our staff digitally safe and how we train them, and then we're going to talk to you about how members of the community can help to create an environment that supports digital safety as well. So we have Kate Masterson, Assistant Director of Digital Safety and Privacy, Gary Newman, our wireless network specialist, and Terry Howe, our network administrator. So without further ado, Kate Masterson. Thank you. Thank you, board, for having us tonight. Pull up our notes. So you saw some of the headlines um, that Christy showed, and they are sobering at best, frightening at worst. And the big question that you may be asking is, what are we doing to keep kids safe? So these are our kids, pictures of our students. And we know that technology plays and will continue to play a role in teaching and learning. That's not really a question anymore. Uh, but I want to share what we're doing at, at Carmel Clay Schools to help keep these precious kids safe. And I want to talk about it in context of something called data governance. And it's this idea of looking at our data holistically, so the collection, protection, use, and the life cycle of our data. And you'll notice in this diagram, technology is a key component, obviously, but more so than the technology are the processes, so the things we're doing with the technology. And then even outside of that, we think about the people, because we can have all the best systems in place, 
But if we don't have people using those systems correctly or knowing what they're for or knowing how to respond, it's not going to matter. So we think about technology as a piece as opposed to the whole picture, which again, which is why we're calling it digital safety as opposed to cybersecurity month. And the goal is really this, to continue to build a culture of digital safety. So that includes students, staff, and our community. We want this to ripple out. So the things that we're doing with students and staff in Carmel Clay schools are going to help make our community safer because no one is immune from these types of attacks. So one of the things we're doing, Christy mentioned, is we're pursuing a national certification. So the Consortium of School Networking, called COSIN, has developed this framework. And it's really unique. It's the only data privacy framework really marketed to the K-12 environment. Because we have really unique data needs. We collect a lot of data. We use a lot of data. And we have a lot of data that other bad actors would like to have access to. So this was developed with school districts across the country, with some national organizations. And it's a pretty rigorous application process. And it's not a once and done type of certification. It has to be renewed every two years. And we have to demonstrate that we're continuing to grow our data privacy and our data security practices. So uh, we're not going to dive deeply into the TLE framework because it is pretty meaty. Uh, but there are five domains, everything from the very highest 30,000 foot view of leadership all the way down to what's happening specifically in an individual classroom. Five domains, 25 practices spread out across those five domains. And I have an example of one of them, just to give you a flavor of, of what this certification process is looking for. So this is leadership practice one. The school, the school system has up-to-date policies and regulations addressing data privacy compliance requirements, which is a mouthful. It's one of the shorter ones. And what they're looking for in this TLE application is not just here are the laws, we follow them. They're looking for the processes and policies that we have in place that show that people understand why, the why we're following these laws, why we need to take this seriously. So we have to provide evidence and then a narrative description of why that evidence supports the practice across all 25. And the kind of change that we're looking for, it takes time. We want it to be deep, and we want it to be just part of what we do. And this work also takes all of us, because student data is not limited to curriculum systems or to our student information system. Student data, staff data, are everywhere. So we have food service. We have human resources. We have student services, transportation. All of these areas we need to work together to make sure that we are taking care of our kids and our kids' data and our staff members' data and our community's data. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about how our perspective on data privacy has grown over the years. So my first year in Carmel Clay Schools was 2007. I was the media specialist at Collegewood Elementary. And just for some context, that was about a month and a half after the very first iPhone launched. So if you think about how much technology has changed since my first day at Collegewood to today, it's several revolutions. So Early in my career at Carmel Clay Schools, we talked about the teacher responsibility for vetting websites, looking at privacy policies, looking at terms of service, getting parental permission if that was required to use a website. And then as more and more websites and apps and tools became available, buildings started to say, this is too much for teachers. We're going to put together a list. We're going to share that, and we're going to, you know, Take some of that off your plate, and we're going to come up with our list of tools that we use in the building, or a grade level, or a department. And now, post-pandemic, when there was a true explosion of ed tech tools, we're transitioning into this idea of the district taking on that responsibility, which is really why one of the reasons why my role was created. And so that involves not just getting parental permission to use apps. I'm not going to go into the specifics of the law. Um, instead, we are working on getting contracts with our vendors, legally binding documents that say, here's what you're doing with our data, here's what you're not doing with our data, and signed on the dotted line. The vendor signs, Mr. McMichael signs on behalf of the district, and they're called data privacy agreements, data protection agreements, data privacy addendums, they go by several names. Uh, we abbreviate it DPA. And so it is a contract, legally binding, 
and looks at several of these things. One of the key pieces of this is designating the vendor as a school official under FERPA, which allows us to share data with them. It's one of the provisions that that law gives us. It also says that we own the data. It's ours, not the vendor's. And it describes what happens to the data when that particular agreement is over. They don't need our data anymore. We're not using that company. They don't get to have it. So it's been a transition. And what we're going to do now is actually a little bit of data privacy evaluation. So I'm going to have this up on the screen. You are welcome to follow along if you like. Uh, but we have a hypothetical scenario. So a teacher has requested um, some technology for her class. And she needs something that will read the text on the screen aloud. So it's a pretty common uh, accessibility tool. Obviously, it could be used for students who have IEPs or 504, specific documentation that says they need to have this accommodation. It's great for MLLs, students who are you know, learning English, students who are emerging readers, students who just need some focus. Sometimes when you know, you're in a busy classroom and you're needing to read text on a screen, if you can listen to it at the same time, that's going to help reinforce those con concepts. And so the teacher requests to have uh, a read aloud tool. And so I'm going to hop in. It's always fun to do a live demo on the internet, but I did test this earlier today, and I have a backup of screenshots just in case. Um, so I'm just going to search for text to speech. So this is the Chrome Web Store. So I'm, what I'm searching here are extensions. They're little programs that live in the Chrome browser, and they do various tasks. So in, in this case, it's text-to-speech. It could be something that lets you, you know, pick the color off a website so you can use that color in your presentation. And so here we have, read aloud, a text-to-speech voice reader. So I'm going to have you take a look at this screen, even before I click on this tool, and ask you what you notice. There's no right or wrong answer. If you want to turn and talk to a partner, I'll put on my good teaching skill. You want our answers? Yes, please. You guys want to? I heard some good things. You guys want to share? I'll, I'll tell you what I heard. Thank you. Um, that the 4.3 out of 5 is not that great, and that there's only 2,500 reviews. So it does have 4.3 stars, which actually for an app store is not terrible. Um, we'll look at how many users have this. One thing that I want to call your attention to are these little symbols here next to um, the website and this featured. They look to me like on Twitter when you have the little blues you know, check mark that says you're official, right? That's what it, it reads to me. If I hover over this, it's going to say, created by the owner of the listed website. The publisher has a good record with no history of violations. So the person who put this tool in the Chrome Web Store gave themselves the check mark. I'm adding that to my list of things as I'm evaluating this tool. Uh, if I hover over featured, it all that means is it follows the recommended practices. So again, just a bit of data that I'm doing in my little analysis. So let's hop in and take a look at this tool. Um, so you know, it does have 2,500 reviews. It has just a couple people who have decided to use it. As I scroll down on this page, it gives me a tutorial video on YouTube and a very brief picture of what I assume the extension looks like when it's installed. You can see it living up there in the browser in Chrome. And then we're going to scroll down to this overview. Now, this is a lot of text here. We're not going to dive into this, because the far more interesting things are over here on the right-hand side. So again, I'm going to give you a minute to take a look. What do you notice? What do you note? There's a privacy policy. They have a privacy policy linked, which is at least a step in the right direction. How about when it was last updated? Recently. Very recently. Um, they have a mailing address, which is in the United States. 
which could be a good sign, but you know what you can do? A little right click and search. And 158 Magellan Ave in San Jose, California is an 1,100 square foot single family home with three beds and one bath. <laughs> Again, people run businesses out of homes, so I'm not saying that that is a deal breaker necessarily, but it's adding to my list of interesting facts about this particular tool. That's true. Yeah, and it could just be, again, extensions are um, small, relatively small little programs, so they may not need um, multiple versions, but that is an excellent thing to check, too. All right, so let's go ahead and we are going to go look at the privacy practices. So here's what they say they collect. Personally identifiable information. Authentication information, which fun fact could include passwords, credentials, security questions, or pins. And then information from the website that you're visiting. Adding all of that to what I know about this company. And we're going to go to the uh, app website. Ooh. What do you notice? What do you note? An audible reaction. <laughs> yes. To... <laughs> That's terrible. And I, it looks perhaps a little homegrown. Uh, if I click around, there's not really much here. There's a support contact form. If I click this share it idea for a suggestion, it takes me to like a crowd surfing feedback kind of website. Um, but they do have their terms of service and privacy policy listed. So let's go ahead and hop into their terms of service, which um, we're not going to read because it's long. They, most of them are. That's not necessarily unusual. So one of the things that I would usually do when I come to a terms of service is do a control F to search and search for 13 because that's the age established by COPPA that student data privacy is no longer in the hands of parents. Um, and it looks like the only references to 13 are in their section 13. So they're not referencing COPPA in that way. So let's try 18. So you must be 18 years of age in order to sign up as a registered user. Individuals under the 18 can use this with the consent of a parent or legal guardian. It's pretty standard language, but it's also makes me ask the question, what are they doing with data that they need parental permission, is basically what it comes down to. When a website says we need parental permission for a student to create an account, they either don't understand the law, which is not uncommon, or they're doing something with the data that requires that parental permission. So now let's take a look at their privacy policy. And sometimes the 1318 will be in privacy. Sometimes it'll be in terms of service. It's always fun to figure out where it, where it lives. So again, the privacy policy is not super robust. It does say that they you have to create an account to use their premium voices. If you don't use the premium voices, you don't need to sign in, and no information is collected. Here is where. I have a huge red flag, because if you remember, uh, we went to the privacy tab, and it definitely said it collected personally identifiable information. But then their privacy policy contradicts that. So which do I believe? It's just a question at this point. So that's their terms of service, and their privacy policy, and their lovely website. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the website of the developer. What do you notice? What do you note? Claudia? Ah, yes. Side chatter. Have side chats with random strangers! Exclamation point. Okay. 
mushrooms. Yes, the little uh, fav icon or fav icon for this particular website happens to be a mushroom. It is called LSD software. LSD, like that LSD. Um, this website has been updated uh, since uh, initial, this kind of initially came into like the data privacy circles. Um, there was a very large leaf prominently displayed on the website. Um, but, you know, there are still some gems here. So I can, um, I can get to the GitHub profile page of the CTO. The CEO link doesn't take me anywhere. I can buy them a cup of coffee if I wanted to put my PayPal information in. And then, as if we needed one more thing, because I think you know where this is going, there's a first-person shooter game embedded on their homepage. So, taking a look at our sweet little read-aloud text-to-speech voice reader, thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up, we're going to install this for students. Thumbs down, we are not. I wish they were all this easy. Like, this one just, it, it's almost funny, except that it's not because four million people are using this. Um, we say a lot in this area, there's no such thing as a free puppy. So this extension is free, but they're making money somewhere. Um, and so this is a hypothetical. This is not installed on any Chrome profile in Carmel Clay Schools. This has not been requested by any teacher. This is like our, our demo account. We have other tools that we use for speech to text. Most of them are built into the Chromebooks already because we like to prioritize the use of the tools we already have as opposed to going out and finding something else. Um, that's not always possible. Uh, but one of the things that we're really excited about in this work, oh, did I have it on there? Because you can't see that. There it is. Is Learn Platform, which is a vendor that we're partnering with. It's going to help support our TLE work in a couple of ways. It shows that the district is serious about data privacy and willing to put funds towards it. So what Learn Platform does is it allows us to see what tools are used by staff and students at Carmel Clay Schools, and then it gives us a really robust library. So the goal, the vision for Learn Platform, as it grows and develops, is for teachers to have a learning goal. Learning always has to come first. So they have this learning goal, they know what they want their students to learn, they're going to come here and they're going to say, all right, so what tools do I have at my disposal to help facilitate that learning? And they'll be able to filter by subject, grade level, type of tool, and see, ah, okay. So this one is approved for special ed. This particular tool is approved for middle school, and it is compliant. Now, you as board members and as staff members have access to Learn Platform right within your staff portal. So there'll be a little tile, Learn Platform. You'll be able to log in and see sort of the employee side where we'll put more documentation for um, staff on how to use tools, that kind of thing. And then this is the public-facing library that we'll be launching with the community in um, hopefully the next couple of weeks, just to help be transparent and show here's what we're doing behind the scenes to help keep our kids safe, because that is our goal. And so with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Barry Newman, and he is going to talk more about a digitally safe staff. All right, thank you, Faith. Um, I like to think she, she mentioned about how are we keeping students safe, and it's not necessarily how are we keeping the staff safe, but really how are we partnering with the staff to make all the staff safe and all the kids safe together. Um, and I think tonight was a great example, really. We saw how it's not just the first responder's responsibility to for the health and safety of people, right? We saw a principal jump into action, a parent, a fan, a coach, and, and it really took everybody to do that. And that's the same thing here. We don't think of it as an IT problem to, to keep us digitally safe. It really takes everybody. So we really want to partner with our staff to help in that regard because um, you'll see there's a lot of similarities between uh, the, the physical safety and, and digital safety, okay? So um, of the Carmel Police Department and our student resource officers really stress this as well. They talk about if you see something, say something, right? You've heard that. They do a training at the beginning of every year. We also have some training for IT security at the beginning of the year. 
they do lots of practices and drills. They use Orchard Park, and we do the same thing. We do uh, practices and we do drills as well to keep everybody safe. Um, and so, you know, if you see something, say something. In their world, it's like if you see a door propped open, that doesn't look right. We need to talk about that. We need to get that to somebody to figure out. Or if you see a visitor wandering around, that's something we need to report, and we can figure that out. And they always stress, don't worry if it's a false alarm or if it turns out to be benign. That's totally okay. Please report it. We'll check into it. It won't take us very long, but l let's get in there and let's look at it first. We'd rather you say something and not be a problem than you not say something and it turns out to be a problem. So. We really want to make sure that we're stressing that. Kate mentioned some things about culture, and that's just one of the things that we're doing as well. Um, for us, 90% of data breaches occur from phishing. Okay, that's a, a monster number right there, and so that's obviously where our focus is, uh, because 90% is a big deal, um, but we know it's not only IT, right? Emails go to everybody, and so everybody really needs to be on their toes to understand what's happening, and really, whether we're talking about a sports team or anything else, you're good at what you practice at. You're going to become good at whatever you practice. So we need to continue to practice. And so we do practices, we do simulations. Um, practice, 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 right? And when you think about that, again, going back to the physical world and things, we do fire drills so that the kids know what to do. We do tornado drills, lockdown drills, all those things. They practice them. And then I don't know if you had a chance to see the from the high school at the explosion, you saw a video of students, after a little bit of wondering what happened there, then they really sprung right into action, and it was a drill, and as if it was a drill, and they just marched right out the door, and that was, that was only possible because they practiced and practiced. So we're going to do that as well. Um, you know, it would be weird if we didn't practice it, right? If we want to be good at it, we've got to practice. And so um, people will also say, well, you're trying to trick us. You're, you're trying to trick us, aren't you? And I would, the way I would respond to that is the bad actors are trying to trick you, right? They want you to click. You saw all the nasty stories that, that Christy was mentioning at the beginning, different school districts that are getting in trouble and having problems. They got, ultimately, they got tricked, right? We need our simulations and our practice routines to be as realistic as possible, okay? Because if you, you wouldn't practice all year against the sixth grade team and then try and beat varsity opponents in a real game, right? You have to be at the top. We need to make them as realistic as possible so that we can we can be better uh, better defensive. Um, so here's here's an example of something. Uh, you might be able to see this on your screens a little bit better, um, but some things to point out. Make sure you're verifying the sender. Okay, we understand that our uh, email structure is you know first initial last name. If you see something out of place, that might be a little bit different. You know, bad grammar a lot of times. That's not an exclusive thing. The, you know, the corollary is not true. Like, well, everything was spelled right, that, therefore it must be a good email. No. But you can see some of these, and they will stick out. And then please, please, the most important thing here is to verify all the links. When you hover your mouse over a link, you can see the little box there. And that tells you exactly where the website is going when you end up clicking on it. Okay, So if you're expecting something from your bank, it better be going to a bank. Otherwise, they're taking you someplace else. Okay, so. Um, we want everybody to report. We told that. See something, say something. Please do that. It makes it so easy by just adding a little button in our email uh, program. So this is Outlook. This will work on your phone if you have Outlook installed on your phone, but also on our, on our desktop. This is the most popular way to read your email. There's a little button right there. You click on it. You report it. And then when you're done, you'll get a little response saying either on the left side here, congratulations, the email you reported was a simulated phishing attack. That was us practicing, okay? Good job, you did it. Um, if you get the message on the other side, that wasn't us practicing, okay? So you reported something else, see something, say something, thank you, we'll look at it. Maybe it's nothing, maybe it's something, but we're happy that you reported it. Um, and then what it looks like for us, or excuse me, what you'll get back in, re in response, it's important to have a two-way communication, right? We want people to report it to us, and we want to have uh, some feedback there. Thank you for sending that in. We're going to take a look at it. This one turned out to be spam. Okay, so that we have a, a structure in the background that does some artificial intelligence scoring, and this one turned out to be spam, and we get a message right away. This one turned out to be a threat. Okay, somebody reported it, 
and it had some threatening things in there. Maybe there was a link that was going to a known bad website. Or maybe there was an attachment that had something that was going to create a virus or a malware and get installed on somebody's machine. So what this does is this triggers us and we go into action because we get this um, on our desktop and we say, hey, we need to know about this and let's go get it. Um, and one of the neat tools that we have in the background here is if we do get something that's a threat, you'll see here a query was automatically started and any found messages will be moved to quarantine. What that means is if I get the message and I report it and it turns out to be threatening, what it can do is check everybody else's mailbox, thousands of mailboxes automatically and see if there was one just like it or exactly like it and pull it out of their mailbox before they even get a chance to click on it. So that's pretty neat when, when it can do that and we can automate it and it goes right into action. And So that's why it's very important that we get um, see something, say something, let us know. We can check it because chances are they didn't just send one, right? They sent hundreds and thousands and it goes everywhere. So very important. Um, and that goes back to our culture that we're trying to promote, get people to report it, do that. Um, there's a story of somebody that was in uh, customer service who ended up getting an email message and clicked on it and it launched malware on her computer and she got very nervous because the culture in her, her workplace wasn't like this and she was very nervous and scared of the repercussions. So she reached over and just turned her computer off, told her boss that she was sick and she was going home for the week. Okay, but unfortunately that's not good enough because the damage had already been done, right? She clicked on it and it started working on things in the background. It spread like a virus does and it just goes and, and, and the damage was, was really bad. And so had she said something right away, you can mitigate that and we can get on top of it right away. <clears throat> what we don't want to do is we don't want to get stuck behind the eight ball, right? We want to know. So please report it. And again, just like the karma police would tell you, false alarms are no big deal. It's okay. Let's look at it. We'll, we'll, we'll get it investigated and we'll see. So <clears throat> um, a little recap. So we do the fundamental trainings. We get some basic awareness. Um, I mentioned the safe schools at the beginning, right? The SROs have their training, we have our training that's mandatory, and all this is part of our know before relationship that we have with the state. Uh, they have a, a wonderful website and they have some things in there and I want to show you one of those because we have something that they've turned into a game a little bit. Spot a fish, okay? And we're gonna do that and you can play along, but I'm gonna actually open up, uh, I'm gonna open up right here, yes. So spot the fish game. This is in, this is everybody has access to this. If you go into the portal and you see an orange circle that says uh, cybersecurity training, that's where we go. So here I'm going to start the course. Okay, we're going to learn about ransomware and bad links and all that stuff. We're going to play a game. Okay, here's a scenario. You log into your computer and this is what you see. What do you do next? Your choices are switch the computer off and on contact IT support and disconnect from the network, or ignore it. Okay, I think we can eliminate one of those, right? We're not gonna just ignore it. <clears throat> what are we gonna do, anybody? Mike, you were shaking your head on the middle one. Yeah, contact IT, right? See something, say something, let's do that. <clears throat> okay, it looks like some things have been encrypted and they want money, okay? So we'll contact IT and disconnect. All right, you did the right thing. Okay, <clears throat> this one was pretty easy. This is what you see. You'll see a lot of that on the website is they present you with a scenario. This is what you could have seen, what you should have seen, some red flags to look for. And uh, let's move on. Let's do another one. Okay. So this is a quick video. <clears throat> it's just uh, about two and a half minutes. So we'll, let's, let's see what it says. How do you know if a link is malicious? If you move your cursor over the URL, it will display the site address it will take you to which works a bit like a physical address. In the example, https colon forward slash forward slash mybank.com, com is the top level domain. Dot com is like the country of the address. Mybank is the primary domain. It's like the name of a company. Now, if we add a prefix making it safetraining.mybank.com, Safe training is separated from the primary domain by full stops, which make them subdomains, a bit like departments within the company. In a URL like mybank.com forward slash banking forward slash main forward slash JSP, banking and main are separated from the subdomain by forward slashes and are subdirectories. 
think of these like filing cabinets. If you hover over the link within an email and it reads mybank.safety.com, it would take you to safety.com, not mybank.com, because safety is the primary domain in this case. Here are signs of malicious or fake links. Full stop splitting the domain name, like my.bank.com. Because of the full stop, this link will take you to bank.com and not mybank.com. Hyphens in front of the domain name, like secure-mybank.com. Because of the hyphen, this link will take you to secure-mybank.com and not mybank.com. Numbers, like 192.45.36.72-mybank.com. If you can't see who owns the site, don't click. Spelling errors. If you're not paying attention, these can fool you. Always read the URL carefully. Links may also be sent using link shorteners. They condense the site addresses and can be confusing as it masks the destination completely. To establish the final destination of the link, make use of a URL expander. General safety rules. If you're not expecting links and attachments, don't trust them. Hover over links and emails to check before clicking. Don't click on HTML attachments in email bodies. They may have hidden links. Type in websites manually or follow bookmarks rather than clicking on links. When in doubt, contact your IT security team and ask. Thanks for watching and remember, think before you click. Okay, so a lot of good points in there, obviously. I probably aren't understand some of those things, but maybe some of those were, were good or maybe good explanations of why you're already confirming what you already knew. So let's play the game. Let's see if we can catch a couple of few of these. Okay, so do you think this email is legit or fish? Let's look around. I'm in a hospital in Dubai. I'm giving away my money. What do you think? Legit? No? Okay, fish. Correct. You earn 10 points. Okay, some of these will get a little more tricky, so let's pay attention now. Okay, so what do we see on this one? Can you hover okay. over the uh, link, please? Yes. Good question. Did you buy something from eBay? I buy things from eBay all the time. Ah, so that's a good point, okay? Um, we'll get to the answer here in a minute, but like, yes, if you get an email from your bank, what you can do is just use your bookmark, go to the bank, log in, and see if there's a message waiting for you in there, okay? You don't have to click on it and hope, right? So uh, that's an excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, for purposes of this, if we're checking the email address at, at ebay.com, that looks good, and when I hovered over the link, I see that it's www.ebay.com. So let's, let's mark it as legit. We've earned 10 points. Okay. Okay. What about this one? Logo looks good, right? It's DHL. Dr. O, before you ask, I'll hover over here. What do we think about that one? Send it to IT. Yes, thank you. See something, say something. I appreciate that. Yes, let's let's market a fish. Okay, we got ten points. So, uh, what do we think about this one? Okay, we see the DHL here. I hover over again. It's DHL. Oh, in, as an attachment, yes, that would be that would be something as an attachment. This is this is a link within the within the email. Okay. 
Yeah, well, sometimes you can order them from someplace else and they use DHL as a courier. But the, the, the key pieces here are the email address looks good, the, the link looks good, we mark it legit, and we unsend it. So it continues like this. There's, there's 21 of these. If you want, like I said, these are, these are available to you. You can go through there and click. Um, no one's gonna no one's gonna come after you if you only get 20 out of 21 or even 15 out of 21. Remember, um, the culture we're trying to build is that you know, we're here to report things to us. No one's gonna jump down your throat if you do anything wrong. Um, we just need to know if there's any issues. So, um, as well within this site, um, there's also a. So I've got a quick. So is this oh, yes. a training module on our? It is a training site? module. Okay. So if you're in the portal. Um, did we close the portal? Okay. But if you go to the portal, um, and you're familiar with that, it is an orange logo with a, with a circle. And uh, I believe it says cybersecurity training is the, is the title of it. And you can go there, and then it'll take you right to your training right here. You'll see Spot a Fish. Um, there are also some, some basics here and some awareness things. Um, they're not required, but it is something that, that's available to you. And it can you know, confirm some of the things that you already know. Um, and one thing that, that from this site, we're not, we're not putting it in this training area, but we are making it available to the staff coming up, um, is going to be the, uh, let me get back to my presentation. Something from the No Before site are these little short little clips. So they're like six to eight minutes of, uh, of like a movie scenario where it's, it's just a show, like six to eight minute show. And... And there's a guy who may or may not be a bad actor, okay? And then you watch him as he sort of infiltrates the company and see what red flags get raised and see if you can spot them and see that. So this is being released tomorrow to the staff. So we'll do like one episode a week and we'll be moving through those. And it's, uh, it's actually fairly interesting. There's been some good feedback from other districts that have done it and people are interested and they're hooked. And it's just a different way of, of getting some more information. Uh, information that people can use not only to help keep the district safe, but also in their personal lives, um, right? Because everybody's got their bank accounts and all those things. So um, that's a good segue. I'm going to introduce uh, Terry Howell. He's going to talk about how that impacts things with our community. Thank you. Okay. Great. So what I'm going to be talking about is how we can work as a community to help keep ourselves uh, cyber, cyber secure. Um, our world is increasingly digital and increasingly interconnected. So while we must uh, protect ourselves, it's going to take all of us to protect us as a community. Um, to aid in this, we'll be discussing some ideas and go over some terms and tools, uh, such as updating your software, thinking before you click, using strong passwords, and using multi-factor uh, authentication for your all accounts. Um, so first, thing at home is making sure you have a good anti-virus uh, software and that you're keeping it up to date. So that CD that you got with that computer that you bought six years ago probably shouldn't be what you're using today to keep your home uh, safe. Um, making sure you're doing updates for your software, so the applications that you use, the off, uh, office um, applications you have installed on both your uh, desktop at home, ta uh, laptops, tablets and phones, and same with the operating system. I know that when you're doing an operating system update, it can sometimes be tedious and take a while. You know, I don't, I'm not, I'm doing something else right now. I don't want to have to shut down and reboot and wait for 10 minutes for it to finish. But um, keeping your software up to date is one of the, uh, or if your software is out of date, that is one of the easiest ways for a threat actor to gain access to your system. So be suspicious of unsolicited phone calls, emails, messages, and texts. Um, we've talked about phishing already um, as a type of social engineering attack. A social engineering attack is when someone's trying to get information from you for nefarious reasons. So uh, not only do we have phishing, but we have smishing, a form of social engineering that exploits text messages. So that text message that you get saying, hey, give me a call, or we're interested in your property, um, be wary of those type of things if it's not something that you're soliciting. Also, we have vi uh, phishing, which is a voice, someone calling you saying, hey, um, I need this information, but not identifying themselves properly. 
or again, it's unsolicited, your bank isn't going to call you asking for your bank account number. So, um, yeah, technology nomenclature, right? Uh, we'll come up with some good ones. Um, so, be aware of what information you're giving out and who you're giving it to. So, with another key point is passwords, making sure you have one password for one site, meaning that we're not using the same passwords for all of our banking, for PayPal, for uh, Facebook, and uh, for Netflix. Don't be making sure that you're, you don't use one key to unlock your car, your house, and your place of business. Don't use one key to open up all your accounts with your computer. And with that, we're going to play one short video. Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Ducklin, and this is a two-minute tutorial on how to pick a proper password. Number one, make your passwords hard to guess. The crooks have dictionaries, books, movie scripts, song lyrics, Facebook, Twitter, and much more. So avoid passwords based on nicknames, birthdays, quotations, pets, anything of that sort. And don't forget that easy passwords don't get harder if all you do is add some digits on the end. Password cracking programs can do that as well. Point two, go as long and complex as you can. Random eight letter passwords look pretty tough with 26 to the power eight possibilities. That's a whopping 200 billion. But a password cracking server costing less than $20,000 under ideal circumstances can try out more than 100 billion passwords each second. So mix together uppercase, lowercase, digits and punctuation a name for 14 characters, or even longer. That may look terribly complicated, but you can make up a little saying to help you out. If you don't like that approach, some people take several unusual words and combine them into a meaningless phrase. Like the XKCD cartoon's famous correct horse battery staple password. But watch out for words that relate obviously to you. They do need to be unusual. And point three, consider using a password manager. Examples include LastPass, KeePass and 1Password. Password managers can make up complex, random nonsense for each account. Plus, they remember which password goes with what website. That also helps protect you from phishing, because you can't put the right password into the wrong page. But do remember, you will need a really good password for the password manager itself. So let's go over the points. Hello everybody, I'm Paul Ducklin and this is a two minute tutorial on how to pick a proper password. Okay, he didn't go away. Um, and we know he, what, he knows what he's talking about because he's British. Uh, <laughs> says it with that accent. Um, so again, make a, your password hard to guess as long as complex as you can, password manager, and uh, one account for one password. Uh, so one of the uh, aspects I talked about is multi-factor, a little bit about what multi-factor is. It's just having more than one factor to be able to log into your system. So uh, it's who you are, what you have, what you know. So a thumbprint rental space for phones, what you have, your phone receiving a text message, um, or applications such as Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, and what you know, so your password. So using two of those items on this list to make sure you're, uh, again, the, I'm talking about your personal accounts, your uh, systems that you use for, uh, day to day. So why use it? It adds layer of security. It makes it much harder for uh, bad guys to get in, and um, it can be makes it difficult to get in. So, uh, a site that we use in our district to help us uh, with uh, vulnerabilities or breaches uh, to uh, notify staff is Have I Been Pwned? And this is on the device in front of you. You can go to this uh, site yourself and put in your own information. So this is, uh, you can put in your uh, 
personal email addresses, and we'll come back with a list of sites that this email has been seen on that has had a green tag. So with that, uh, I'm going to jump in, and then what do you do? Because I already did that when yep. I reviewed this, and I'm like, hmm, 13 sites. Do I just change my password? Well, it depends on what information they have. Um, go back to my presentation. Okay, so what do you do? So this is a site that um, came up w for one of our individuals, uh, the Home Shelf. So here are some things that, you know, looking at this, it's telling you what was compromised. Your, the email address was uh, found, geographical lo location, so where you live, um, name, partial credit card data, so that could be just the last four digits of the credit card. It could be the whole credit card without the security key at the end. Um, password and phone number. So one thing I am asking myself if I have this site or I'm using this site is, okay, I see that I've, this has had a breach. Did they contact me? Did they let me know that my data was potentially uh, lost or threat actors could have it? Where else have I used this password? So if I haven't uh, used the uh, one password per site, where else have I used that? Is that on my bank account? Is that on my uh, PayPal? Is it Netflix, I don't like I'm watching my movies. Um, what credit card am I using um, on that site? So am I need to take a look at credit card activity and uh, see what activity has uh, been on that. And consider also um, using a, I'll be getting to this as well, but when you're doing online shopping, having a credit card specifically for online use only, and having that credit card have a possible lower uh, spending limit. So if it does get compromised, they're not buying the boat or house or new fancy new car. Um, so some additional proactive, first, did that answer the question? Great. Uh, proactive steps. Use something to, do, uh, use some of the sites for credit card freezes, um, Equifax, there's a number of them that you can you will go to and tell them to freeze your credit so that someone cannot open up a card and use it. Um, again, use one credit card for online shopping, a different password per site, password manager, multi-factor authentication, closing accounts that you no longer use. So if that um, account is not something you need and it has your data hanging out in it, consider closing it so that um, you can remove yourself from that site. Uh, remove unnecessary software on your phone. So if you're not using, again, the same concept, if you're not using that software on your phone, there's no reason that it needs to be taking up space and potentially collecting data. Make sure you have a backup. So at, at home, you can, uh, uh, storage is very inexpensive right now. So you can get an external hard drive, external uh, thumb drive, and make backups of those key files that you'd be really upset if you lost, if you did get hit with ransomware at home. So those photos, those uh, tax documents, anything that um, would be hard to replace. Knowing, also knowing what devices are connected to your home network. So most uh, home routers have software that comes with it that are anything of a brick and you can find a line on how to get to it but we'll show what devices are connected. So if you go into the software and see, you might be surprised on how many devices are connected to your home network. It's not only the TV, it's a thermostat, it's a refrigerator, um, and tablet. Um, so going to the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, we'll play this other short video. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> 
like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. Mm -hmm. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. And what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. So Jolie, six, 12, oh, 95. Yes. Got it. So you mean to give my password right now? No, I cannot do that. But we all want to know what it is so we can tell you if it's strong or not. Oh my goodness. Um, um, let me think. Okay, one is Tel Aviv. Yeah. Four, six, eight. And then Israel. It's, it's only three, but it's, you know, it's, uh, for me it's strong enough. Ireland. One, two, three, four. Gemma. One, two, three. Spelled G-E-M-M-A. Well, most of them are Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, like so what, like. Like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's uh, name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. So. Uh, this was somewhat of extreme, and of course they, you know, probably interviewed hundreds of people, and these are the five or six that answered. Uh, but it also goes back to it takes only one person uh, to be the hole in the armor. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. Okay, so digital citizenship. Be vigilant. Report suspicious activity, keep secure passwords, credit freeze. You can, uh, one of the sites that you can also use for finding, to removing yourself from those uh, web pages that you no longer use is just delete me. It shows a, uh, gives you a long list of all the popular uh, websites that you can then, uh, gives you directions or a link directly to the page to walk, walk through on how to remove yourself from that site. Ask questions. With that, questions. Well, <laughs> well, first off, thank you guys so much. Um, greatly appreciated all the things that you shared with us and learning. And I know we had a lot of um, uh oh moments up here. So I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple questions, but first I'm going to open it up to the board. Do you guys have anything? Those three password manager options that were suggested, do you recall what they were? It went too quickly before I could write them down. KeyPass, KeyPass, OnePass, and... Wait, put those again? KeyPass, LastPass, and OnePass. I use OnePass. And OnePass. Called one password. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. If you don't store your credit card information in-house, is that the best way? That's definitely a great step to not store it on the site, yes. But if the vendor who you purchased something from online had a copy of that credit card number in one of their files, and then they are breached, that, that credit card number still could be part of a compromise. Any other questions? So how come I shouldn't be scared of have I been pawned when it spells wrong? Oh. And, and is, it, is it have I been pawned.com and it's P-W-N-D? P-W-N-E-D. Yes. Dot com. Dot com. That's correct. So what that is that particular site is doing is it is actually scouring the internet and finding the breaches that occur. So that particular uh, developer is simply reproducing information that they are finding and helping you identify what is available online. Um, even some of the vendors such as OnePass will identify for corporations when they see accounts from those corporations. So it is one that is considered to be fairly um, useful to the end user. I'll just comment, so for one password, they'll, they'll get mad at me and say that's a reused password or this has been compromised. Um, but the nice thing is it like has password generators, so it does the really long, crazy, complicated ones, and then it stores them. 
so I don't have to remember. And then the worst part is, like it said, is you have to have a very good password for that because if you lose it, you have to go through crazy hoops. Like there's like a key that you have to have that we have in a very special locked location just in case worst case scenario happens because you can't just forgot, forget password on one password sort of thing. And really, you're exactly correct, Ms. Browning. The whole goal of a site such as 1Password is for you to only have to remember 1Password. And it's your 1Password to get into that site because then it takes care of remembering your password for all the other hundreds of sites you use. So if you can get your brain to remember one 14 or 15 character long password, then the software will take care of all the rest of the rest. We even have that with our, uh, like our will, mm -hmm. like the how to access that in case of emergencies, because it does have everything. Absolutely. Everything, so. And a lot of those tools do a little more than just um, sharing passwords as well. They can um, store files that might contain sensitive information like a will or something like that. And you can often share passwords with your family or with other coworkers depending on what organization is using those tools as well. Any other so when we have yeah. these updates and somehow I have missed in our website or on our portal that because I did get on while you were talking, the extensive opportunities for phishing, um, learning professional development, um, and all these little short snippets of learn a little more, learn a little more. Will you be sending emails to the team, the so, entire CCS team to say, hey, there's a new one out there, check it out? So that's a great question. Our technology coordinators in our building are responsible for sharing the information and opportunities for learning. and so. That could be a little bit of a gap that we have in our process, making sure the five of you get that information because that's our job here to make sure that you get information just like the staff at ESB. We might have. Sometimes I miss things. Well, so it might not be okay. you. It could very well be me. <laughs> I just didn't realize it was so um, easily expansive. Yep, there's a ton of information in there. So we'll make sure that you're included. Tomorrow's new um, movie series that is coming out is actually going to come out from Emily's office tomorrow that she'll be um, sending that to the entire staff. And then after next week, or after this week, each week after that, the technology coordinators will be sharing the next video each week um, for the next series that we're doing. Okay. When you send out little um, email tests yes. for us to learn, yes. kind of our little lunch and learn, um, I sometimes, well, probably frequently, I just skim through things, and I'm like, yeah, that's good. Trash, trash, trash. And so I just delete everything. Will you or do you usually send a blanket email to everybody to say, this was a test? I know I've received that in the past, especially the one that Roger said I did something wrong. And I'm like, oh, and I clicked on that one. So that was, you know, that was several years ago, and that was a big deal. Um, and so did several others. But my question is, will you send an email to everybody to say, this was identified and continue to give us the um, percentages of people who were caught and how we can continue to improve. Yes, we um, have opted to move to a twice, like every other month, where we're providing the update as to how that um, phishing training actually went down and what different groups were um, affected by the training. And then Kate also just shared with um, all of our principals for their different buildings the percentage of staff that clicked and reported in a proper way because we're wanting to hit 100% of folks reporting um, alerts. We don't, it's great if they delete them, that's wonderful, but if it is an actual outbreak and we can get it out of other people's mailboxes by somebody reporting it, our goal is to get people reporting as much as possible. So we're also sharing that statistic with principals so that they can incentivize their staff and get them to continue to um, provide updates to us when they see something that looks suspicious. So. If it's already filtered in junk, yep. I mean, I just delete my junk. That's great. Is that what That's most people fine. do? Yes. yes. So if it's already in junk, you do not need to report it from there. If it's already okay. in junk, that's great. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, a couple things. Um, Kate, I was disappointed not to see your post-it note wall picture oh, on here. Yes. So she has on Twitter, She put, it's the DPAs, right? All the agreements that you get signed, you add another post-it note with all the things. So I love that because it keeps getting bigger. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I expect a tweet because I'm, I've been, you have fans yeah. that are waiting <laughs> for your post-it note wall to get bigger. So thank you so much for your work on that. Um, another thing that just happened today that I have to share with you is we, um, these actually did good jobs, so I'm bragging a little bit. But so we have on the iPhone where my students, my students, my my children have to, we have to, we, they have to approve for an app. Yes. Okay. So we got an app, and so and I'm at work, and so but I have a group text with my daughter and my husband, and she says you need to approve this app, and my husband's like, what are you talking about? And then she's like, look, I sent you something, and then I see in the text he says I am not letting you get a VPN, and then. Um, she's like, I have to have it. I have to have it. Like my teacher says, I have to have it. And so I was like, mm. so I was like, we'll talk about this at dinner. So then we come to dinner tonight and I said, I was like, did your teacher really tell you that you need to get a VPN? I was like, because I have a workshop tonight and I can ask if teachers, and she goes, wait, 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 wait. She's like, I was like texting on my watch and I said, my friend said that I should get a VPN. And I was like, mm -hmm, that's exactly right. <laughs> so she got caught. So she's in trouble. Yeah. But one of the things I think was good is that at least, you know, we were smart enough to know that you should not be getting a VPN. Her reason was that it would make the Wi-Fi go faster at the high school. No. But um, <laughs> fake news. So <laughs> so my, my whole point of the story is tell you that it, what about training for parents? Like, we knew about that. We knew that that was not true and that teachers would not be telling them to get a VPN. But all of these things are great. But so we have that. Do you guys participate in like the learning portal on the, the website? Do, do you guys share out these kinds of things for our family so that yeah. they do not fall to the things that I try to get hooked into today? Yeah, that's a great question. So our uh, trainer is not actually um, here with us this evening, Abby Pagrzinski, but she just did a series for teachers to start um, the fall that was called the first 20 days where she offered little tips for teachers to use in their classroom to help manage the online learning environment. And as an outcome of that, we heard some requests for, hey, wouldn't it be good to do a 20-day series for parents? So that is an initiative that she has on her radar and some things that we can continue to put into the portal online for parents to help them as well. So that's on our roadmap. Perfect. Well, parents, don't be gullible like my child was trying to get me to do tonight. Um, the other thing is um, something that just came up recently is the tips about multi-factor. So I as annoying as it is to have to sign in multiple times for the same thing, um, something that I just recently, as I had to do multi-factors, and was not to make sure that it's all on your phone. So there's like the thumbprint and the face, because if you lose your phone, then you're kind of like out. So you guys touched on it a little bit, so I thought that was really appropriate, in making sure that, you know, maybe one's to your email and then one's to your face ID. So just making sure that you kind of do that separation. So appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all the good work you're doing. Post-it note wall. I'll be watching. Um, th thank you guys so much for everything you do. And um, on behalf of the school board, we're very thankful for everything. Thank you. All right. We will now move on to board, oh wait, to reports. Okay. Um, I do have an update for you as a board. So one of my goals this year um, as president was that I wanted to have a document that really kind of outlined some of the things that we do um, addition, in addition to our bylaws and our policies. Um, I didn't realize until the past couple months that, that that's a very common thing for boards to have called board norms, which really kind of outlight some of the things that we do um, maybe traditionally or maybe just in the past that are kind of outside of our policies and bylaws. Um, like, for example, um, I am, as board president, the spokesperson, so I usually am the one that responds to emails. That's, you know, not necessarily laid out in our policy. It's kind of more of a tradition that I will be the response to their emails. So something of a document that kind of lays that out. So I just wanted to kind of let you guys know that I've been working on that. Um, I will bring that to you guys at our next board meeting um, in... November, at the end of October um, for discussion. And then similar to how we do the legislative letter and our communication expectations, um, bring that to a vote just in, um, for the board meeting prior to that. So I just wanted to let you know that I'm currently working on that and that will be shared coming forward. I appreciate that, Katie. If we have some norms that we 
feel like we want to be sure that are included, do you want us to just send those to you in an email or call or how shall we? Yeah, just let filter me. Yeah, just let me you. know. I'm really kind of just doing a rough draft right now, mm -hmm. um, and then I definitely want this to be a very collaborative effort to make sure that I'm not misspeaking or change anything. Um, I think this is something that will be very helpful going forward, and so it's kind of documented and our public can see it and. Um, as we will probably have two, maybe three um, new board members coming in January, I think it will be something that will be definitely um, helpful for them as well. I think it's a great idea. Um, it really goes along the lines with we have our guiding principles, we have our communication expectations. These are you know, kind of some you know, un unwritten rules, but how we behave. Yeah, and it's yeah. obviously something that's just more is more informational, non-binding, or right. anything like that. So just want to let you guys know that I'm working on that. So, um, it's document um, you can also if you're looking there's lots of school districts across the country that do a board norm document so you mm -hmm. can look at different examples that they have and everything so at our next general meeting I will bring that to board discussion so I'll present it to you kind of show you kind of my rough draft any thoughts comments please let me know and then the meeting following that in November um, we'll vote on that okay um, I know that next meeting I'm gonna be out of town so after you present it can you then forward it so I'll be able to see it yeah, it'll be on the um, the information at the okay. meeting, but yeah, of course. Okay, I just wanted to kind of give you guys an update, so thank you. All right, now Dr. Dudley, um, who is standing in for um, Dr. Beresford tonight. Thank you guys so much for being here. Superintendent's report. Great. Well, thank you, Mrs. Browning. Well, first of all, I'd just like to start with what a great meeting we had tonight, starting with, you know, our... Um, Spotlight on excellence with our community, and then um, ending with our digital safety and the great work that um, our team is doing and how it's just everyone's responsibility. And so we are so fortunate to have um, a very small but a very responsive um, team that works to help lead that digital safety for everybody. And thank you, Mrs. Cloud, and the rest of the team. We appreciate the work that you guys do. Thanks. Great job. So first of all, I'd like to share that our Carmel High School Greyhounds have been very busy. We have the girls' golf team won the state championship, and this is their third title in the program's history, the first title since 2013. So we're very proud of our Carmel girls' golf team. And this is the 166th IHSAA team state championship for Carmel High School. So wow. Not only the state championships, but um, the boys cross country team are sectional champs. The unified flag football team are sectional champs. The boys soccer team are sectional champs. The girls soccer team are sectional champs. And the boys tennis team are all sectional champs. As we said, the Greyhounds have been very busy. Um, not to um, be deterred, our Creekside eighth grade football team won the county tournament. So we're very proud of them. Um, a, our Creekside Jennifer Carsons, our social studies department chair, is the finalist for the ISSP Academic Coach of the Year Award. And we have a special shout out to Clay Center Elementary second grader, James. He was given a special recognition from the school resource officer, Luke Gossett, for helping his school stay, stay safe. He heard a rumor that it made him feel a friend might need some help, and he spoke up. He went to his SRO and already knew the phrase, if you see something, say something. So great job, James. And for our bell ringer tonight, our bell ringer is that Dr. Beresford was named the District 5 Superintendent of the Year by the Indiana Association of Superintendents. And so this award, is, this award is so extra special because it's voted on by his peers um, other superintendents who understand the job, the very hard job of being superintendent. And there are 40 central Indiana school systems in District 5, and we couldn't agree more with them that Dr. Beresford is the best. So congratulations to Dr. B. Who is celebrating by taking the day off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we wish him well. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Dudley, Mr. McMichael, Dr. Ostrike for being here. Colleen, as always, we could not do this without you. Thank you so much for those of you in the audience and for those of you working at home. I wish you a very safe and fun fall break, and we will see you next time. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned.